The time of Easter is a time to reflect on how we know that Jesus is alive despite having died on the cross. That is why Luke reminds us at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles that during the 40 days after Easter Sunday, 2,000 or so years ago, give or take, in the 40 days after that Easter Sunday, including Easter Sunday, of course, he showed himself to his disciples, and he showed himself alive. But he showed himself alive in ways that invariably was unrecognizable at first. And so the church from the very beginning had to reflect on how Jesus was alive, recognizing from the first that his risen life was a mystery, beginning from his very first appearance in his resurrected and glorious body to St. Mary Magdalene. We must never forget, but rather always remember, that to one of his most devoted and closest disciples, he appeared to her not as he looked before and on his death, on the cross before his death, but rather he looked like a gardener. So from the first, Mary Magdalene was thrown into mystery, thrown into a relationship with mystery that she had no control over. And in that relationship with the mysterious, resurrected and glorified body of Christ present to her, she was led into the mystery of Christ's presence, led into the mystery of how Christ was alive. She had no control over it. It was the Holy Spirit guiding her into the recognition of Jesus who on the surface looked like a gardener. And even in his voice didn't sound like himself until he said her name and she, he said her name, Mary. And the mystery of how Christ's resurrected and glorious body was present with her, the mystery of how Christ was alive, was opened to her. She was led into it by the sound of Christ's voice. For the, for the next resurrection appearance, it was to two disciples later that morning who wanted to walk to Emmaus about a, day, a day's journey away. They wouldn't get there till dinner. A stranger walked with them for the multi-hour uh, multi journey. This stranger, they did not recognize these two disciples. We're told that it was Jesus. And we're invited to reflect on the fact that he walked with these two disciples for several hours, talking with them, reflecting on scripture with them, showing how the books of the Old Testament were about him. They didn't know who was walking with him. Even though they heard his voice, even though they heard his voice talking about Jesus. They were led into the mystery of Christ's resurrected and glorious body. They were led into the mystery of how Christ was alive. Not like Mary Magdalene was led into that mystery. But rather, it wasn't until they arrived at their destination, the town of Emmaus, they asked this stranger to stay with them, and they went into their house, and they had a meal, and these 
were two Jewish religious disciples, and so they would have had something of a, their meal would have had a religious character to it, involving prayers, involving psalms, involving a remembrance of their own story as Jews, tracing all the way back to Moses, and being released from their bondage when they crossed the Red Sea. And in this religious meal where, where they remembered their identity, this man took bread and he blessed the bread and he broke the bread and he gave the bread to them. And it was at that moment that they recognized Jesus alive. It was at that moment that they recognized Jesus in his glorified and resurrected body. A real body. The body who had walked with them and talked with them and had eaten with them. But nonetheless, Christ's presence with them, Christ's aliveness with them, was a mystery they were led into by the actions of Jesus and by his words. Taking the bread, blessing the bread, breaking the bread, and giving the bread, speaking to them during that time, saying, this is my body, I imagine. Well, this is what the church did for those 40 days. They never saw Jesus according to the superficial look of him before he died. They saw him. They talked with him. They touched his wounds. He came into the room, the upper room, to be with them. He appeared to them by a lake and turned a empty nights of fishing miraculously into a catch of 153 whoppers that should have broken the nets, but didn't. But even when he appeared to them on this beach, they didn't recognize him physically, although they saw a man and they heard a man. Here, they were led into the mystery through the, the miracle of his abundance the 153 fish, and again led into the mystery and recognized him when he asked them to come to the shore. And they ate together a meal of fish and bread, which reminded them of the feeding miracles that Jesus did when he was alive, miraculously feeding 4,000 and 5,000. So they remind, they, now they recognized him because what was happening was a direct replication of something that had happened months or years ago. Well, all of this, this reflecting on the mystery of Christ and how he is alive and being led into the mystery of how Christ is alive is called mystagogy. And it's a word that simply means being led into the mystery of Christ. Not yourself climbing into the mystery, but being led, it's being drawn, being beckoned, being invited. Once the ascension of Jesus happened after the 40 days, after his multiple appearances to them, the largest group to which he appeared was 500 people. He ascended and told them, right before he ascended, to go back to the upper room, go back to the room where he, he had instituted the Last Supper, had washed the feet of the Twelve, and had given some of his most profound teachings and what's called his farewell discourse, Furthermore, go back to the room where he appeared on Easter Sunday evening 
And then the first Sunday after Easter, eight days later again, that time with Thomas, you recall, who wasn't present the first time. And that's when Jesus, in this mysterious but real body, showed his wounds and invited Thomas to touch his wounds and behold his wounds. And that's when Thomas first proclaimed the truth of the resurrected body of Jesus by saying, my God and my Lord, my Lord and my God. So Jesus said to the disciples at his ascension, go back to this room, go back to this sacred space, go back to what we must understand is the first truly and uniquely Christian church. And it was in Jerusalem, and it was the upper room, the second floor, the first floor which of which was the tomb of David. So it's holy space for Jews, and now it's holy space for these Jews become followers of Christ followers of Jesus. These Jews become Christians. And they were in this room for nine more days, actually ten. And it's a miracle of sorts. Well, maybe it's not, maybe a miracle isn't quite the right word. It's a profound curiosity that St. Luke doesn't tell us but breadcrumbs about what they did during those nine days. You would think that Luke would want to tell us a lot of what they did during those nine days. This was, after all, the first group of Christians. And they, they knew that Jesus was alive because he had appeared to them in so many ways. It was a mystery they knew, but they were drawn and led and invited so deep into the mystery over these 40 days that they knew he was alive. They couldn't see him anymore because he had ascended to the right hand of the Father. But they knew he, that he was alive. So now the mystagogy, the, the reflections of the early church shifted it was no longer a reflection solely on the question of how is he alive? They somehow knew. But now it was the mystery of the church. And, and Pentecost is called the birthday of the church for this reason. It's because the church the, the early Christians, the 120 people were, who were told, who were in the upper room, knew that Jesus was alive and now had to ask the question, what does it mean to be a church? And so their, the mystagogy in Easter shifted to become an upper room mystagogy, a mystagogy into the mystery of the church, the mystery of Christ's body, which is the church, because they were Christ's body now. These 120 men and women were Christ's body now. And furthermore, they knew how to read the scripture and find Jesus in the scriptures, which for them was what we call the Old Testament. They knew how to do it. And this became a joyful thing to find their Lord and Savior, who they knew was alive, but find him in a concentrated kind of aliveness as they sang the Psalms together, like we just did. And as they sang the hymns and canticles together, as we just did. And how do we know they did that? Because they were devout religious Jews. And this is what devout religious Jews did when they were together. Three times a day, morning, noon, and night, had prayers, they sang the psalms, and they sang the canticles, and they reflected on scripture. But now, their Jewish tradition of doing so, their Jewish experience of doing this, 
was transformed because they, they could hear, they could feel, they could see Jesus with them as the psalms were sung. They could hear, they could see, they could feel Jesus with them, present with them, as they sang the canticles that they'd sung their whole life. But now, they were brand new. Jesus was in them. Jesus was evoked by them. They were, in a manner of speech, feasting on the Word in a brand new way. Feasting on the Word which was Jesus. Receiving the Word into their minds and into their souls. Eating the words of Scripture. Because these words of Scripture were Jesus. And Jesus said to them, take and eat. He said to them, take and drink. He had said that to them in this very room, 40 or 45 or by this time, 49 days before. And so the mystery of the church was a mystery of how we feast on the Word, knowing that the Word is Christ. He is the eternal Word. He is the eternal Word of God who has always been alive, they knew now. Alive before His incarnation, they knew now. And alive after His death, they knew now. Alive in the Scriptures, they knew now. Alive also in the room where they were, this church, this Holy of Holies, where the Eucharist had been instituted, and Jesus instituted the sacrament of holy orders when he washed the feet of the men. And he gave them profound teachings, which the last chapters of which are in St. John's Gospel, and they sum up all of Jesus' life and ministry in those final chapters before he went out into the Garden of Gethsemane and his passion began. In this holy space was Jesus in so many ways, and one of them was in them. So the mystery of the church, this upper room mystagogy, was, a, was an experience of such thickness for them. They were th caught up in the living waters of God in this room. They were caught up in the eternal light of light, which was in this room. All the times that Jesus said, I am, <coughs> I am the bread of life, I am the vine. All the times Jesus said, I am, he was in that room. This is why the room exploded on the morning, the next morning on Pentecost. This is why the, the mighty winds busted the doors off the place. This is why tongues as of fire rested on the heads of the 120 people present who had been present for these nine days. They were so full of grace by recognizing how Christ was present with them that it exploded. It was like a, a pot of water that had just boiling over. They couldn't contain it anymore. This truth of how Christ was present. This truth about how love was present. This truth about how the world was going to be saved by recognizing the presence of Jesus. A presence which is made aware to us by actions of love, actions of self-giving, actions of feeling the presence of someone loving us. And so this is what the 120 people gathered in the upper room then felt called to do, was to go out into the world because Jesus had told them to go to the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go and immerse the world in the reality, the thick, soupy, 
love-filled reality of the upper room. Immerse the world in this. And this is what we, brothers and sisters, are caught up in and have been caught up in ever since we were baptized. We were caught up into this thick love that began in the upper room and has spread to all the ends of the world, east and west, north and south. We were caught up into this, this fellowship of the apostles, caught up into the breaking of the bread, and caught up into the prayers of the church, the singing of the psalms, the singing of the canticles. We've done that tonight. And Christians will do that tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. Just like Jews did daily. Christians are caught up into this thick fellowship of the church that began in the upper room. And so upper room mystagogy, that is to say, being led by the Spirit of God into the mystery of the church, is what we are living and breathing right now. Who are we? We are the body of Christ. And what are we to do? Share this love with the world.